This week on Waterways, Taylor Slough Hydrology, March for Parks, and Species Spotlight on Hogfish. a place in South Florida where few ever travel. At first look, this place seems to be pristine, unmolested by the human species. However, a closer look reminds us that there is not a place on earth not influenced by man. This place is Taylor Slough and may hold the key to the unraveling puzzle of the South Florida ecosystem. Connecting the Everglades wetlands with Florida Bay, Taylor Slough is a river where fresh water from the mainland meets the salt water of Florida Bay. Along with Shark River Slough, these tributaries have been directly manipulated by the Army Corps of Engineers in their attempt to control the distribution of fresh water in South Florida. While good intentioned, this redistribution of fresh water has been linked by researchers to the many ecological problems of Florida Bay. Proof of the importance of Taylor Slough to plant, animal, and fish species is dependent on the systematic and diligent collection of hydrology data from Taylor Slough. Pete Frezza, a staff researcher at the Audubon Science Center in Tavernier, Florida, is part of a team of scientists dedicating themselves to this effort. Once a month, Pete snakes his way upriver to designated data collection points. The journey is often hot and arduous, and the thick mangrove hammocks tightly enclose the watery trail. things we're going to be doing out here today is monitoring the submerged aquatic vegetation. Uh, this is part of a, an ongoing project we've been doing for the past six or seven years to monitor the health and, the st and stability of the submerged vegetation down here. Pete first begins his monthly ritual far inland in Everglades National Park, collecting plant data. At sample points, he takes note of different plant and algae species that grow. Identifying the different species and their rate of growth could prove integral to scientists' understanding of the complex interactivity within the ecosystem. Next, Pete collects data on water levels. These levels indicate the amount of water moving through Taylor Slough. What this is here is a Telog potentiometric recorder, and what it does, it measures water level every 30 minutes and when we come out here to the field we can download all the data with our laptop computer. By combining traditional scientific modeling with newer computer technology and programs, Pete and his cohorts maximize their time in the field. Pete also calibrates the field recorder to ensure accurate and reliable data. The maintenance of the field recorders and sensors is a significant part of Pete's day. Without his efforts, the information collected remotely by computers would lose their pinpoint accuracy. This probe, which collects data on water salinity, temperature, pH, and the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water, relays information via cell phone back to Audubon's Tavernier Research Center. The information that we get from these data loggers, along with the other environmental data we collect with our other equipment, is very useful for our, for our studies. Um, it allows us to correlate our information we receive from our plant and fish surveys with the real-time environmental data. 
After the remote field stations have been checked, cleaned, and downloaded, Pete begins an effort that can only be done by man, not machine. Continuing his monitoring of plants and algae living in Taylor Slough, Pete dons his snorkel and fins and observes underwater. So the way we survey the submerged vegetation is by using this quadrat. This is a quarter meter squared. And within this quadrat, there are a set number of points. And at each site we go to, we, twi we take 12 random throws of the quadrat. And we count the number of plants that are at each set point. And we also take note of different species that are in within the quadrat. This data collection technique is called the point intercept coverage method and has proven to be an effective and efficient way of monitoring. Pete begins on one end of the basin in Taylor Slough and randomly throws his quadrant. As the quadrant sinks to the bottom, Pete records the species that grow within its borders. The information collected conveniently estimates the percent coverage of the entire area. affected by the, uh, the wet season, dry season cycle that we go through each year. Uh, during the wet season, which occurs during the summer months, when you have lots of rainfall coming down through South Florida and, and the Everglades, you have large amounts of fresh water flowing through the system and emptying into this region, and it becomes almost a totally freshwater environment with uh, freshwater plants and algae covering the bottom here. And then as the wet season turns into this dry season, is much less rainfall and much less water flowing through the Everglades. And the water level drops here and salinities rise. And you actually get a, a wedge of salt water pushing in from Florida Bay. And this becomes almost a marine environment. The web of nature is very complex. And Pete and the staff at the Audubon Science Center have no illusions about the magnitude of their studies. While Pete spends time collecting and compiling his data, other researchers are busy collecting data on fish and bird populations. Only through the synthesis of all the data combined, plus information from other organizations and authorities, can a complete picture be painted. The vegetation that we're surveying out here are very important because they're the bottom of the food chain. Uh, they provide food and shelter for an abundance of organisms, including small plankton and mollusks, and small prey fish, which are prey for larger predator fish and also wading birds. There is little doubt that plant and animal populations in South Florida are directly related to the distribution of fresh water. While passions are strong around policies shaping South Florida's ecosystems, facts can influence the outcome of certain issues. With the data collected by Pete Frezza and other surveys, Researchers are hoping to determine what is best for the environment and the future of water management. There are 385 parks in the National Park System. While the government acts as steward for these parks, they are collectively owned by the people of the United States. The number of people who visit national parks every year reaches into the millions. 
but the demographics of the visitors are not proportionately equal to the ethnic diversity of this country. In 1990, an outreach program was started called March for Parks. March for Parks is a nationwide effort to involve communities in park protection and to teach people about the complexity of the natural and cultural heritage preserved in the network of parks across the country. Historically, March for Parks was an event that was run by the MPCA and now the national um, parks have adopted these events and historically they were to raise funds um, for the parks. Um, Everglades National Park did this event last year and they've been doing it from what I understand for a few years and now this is our first um, time we've done it here in the park in Biscayne National Park and considering that this is 95 percent water um, it was quite a challenge to bring people out here for a march and for an event when we have a very little um, landmass. Although national parks have been around for 130 years, most people are completely unaware of their location or the programs and activities offered by the staff. When people picture national parks, many envision the expansive national parks of the West. However, there are four national parks in South Florida. The March for Parks program aims at sparking interest among those who have never experienced the beauty of these ecosystems. Well, the National Parks Conservation Association in 1999 did a conference called Mosaic in Motion where we brought together 650 people from across America that represent diverse communities that don't traditionally have a history of being active in the parks or even we found many of them don't even know about the park system and one of the reasons we found that people don't uh, frequent the parks apart from the lack of information is the lack of transportation the lack of accessibility today many of the people who are here are people from the urban areas of downtown Miami and nearby Homestead and Florida City many of these people although they live within 10 miles of the park are here for the first time after arriving by bus the participants were led on a half-mile nature walk by park rangers. Along the way, rangers pointed out plant species and answered a barrage of questions about the different animals that inhabit the park. The dozens of cultures represented by the marchers were mirrored by the diversity of species in the surrounding wilderness. Even though there was rangers from all different divisions, today they were all interpretive rangers. And in interpretation, a lot of people do not know what that means. And it's not interpreting languages, you're interpreting nature or a monument or something special to visitors to the park. So here you were interpreting different activity stations and of course Biscayne National Park, Everglades National Park was represented and Dry Tortugas National Park was also represented. And an interpretation, you really need to have a one-on-one -on -one con contact or at least as close to that as you can possibly get. I got the pictures from the parade and I got my pictures back. <laughs> After the march, participants could choose from a dozen different activities, from kayaking and canoeing to educational games and races. For most kids and some parents, this would be their first time in a kayak. Seeing the reaction on these children's faces, on the adults' faces, on all the visitors, on how much they're enjoying themselves here, it, it means the world to me. 
to hear them laughing and smiling and get in a canoe for the first time that a lot of us take for granted when we have a canoe, when we have accessibility to these resources and to see them get in a canoe for the first time or get to a national park for the first time, receive a junior ranger badge and put it on with a lot of, of pride, it, it, it touches my heart, it really does. Most people who participated in the Everglades and Biscayne National Parks, March for Parks, were first-time visitors. While lack of transportation is often cited as the reason these folks never visited before, there were many who simply had no idea that this haven was theirs to enjoy. The March for Parks initiative was succeeding in its goal to inform and educate the surrounding public. The ultimate goal of public participation in the preservation and protection of the parks had begun. On an everyday basis, and including the special events that we have out here, we usually advertise or send out general press releases um, to Homestead and Miami also, but we get a very um, limited audience in terms of demographics, in terms of minorities being represented in these groups that come out to the park. Um, very limited, I would say, and that goes for all national parks. But not only bringing them out here to a national park, but making sure that they understand that these parks are theirs, that these parks are for them and for their enjoyment so they can come back here and our activities are free of charge. This is all theirs and that's what we really wanted for them um, to understand is that we're always here 364 days a year. The dedicated staff of Everglades National Park and Biscayne National Park are a bridge between the environment that they work in and the people who live around them. By sharing their knowledge and passion for this delicate ecosystem, they enrolled a traditionally excluded portion of the population into a growing list of citizens concerned about the environment and the earth. Within the same theme of these national parks being for everyone is the idea that nature does not discriminate. Nature um, doesn't believe in culture or nationality or race, we're all one, and that's what this is here for. National parks, you come and enjoy um, nature, and it doesn't matter what your background is, because nature is like a universal language. As Spanish, English, and even Creole could be heard among the sound of birds and the wind in the trees, each participant was reminded of their own place in this world and their responsibility in shaping it. Common name, hogfish. Family, Labradae. Genus, Lachnolamus. Species, Maximus. Size, attains length of three feet. Distinctive features, first three spines of dorsal fin are long. Black blotch near end of dorsal fin. Color, vary from pearl white to mottled or banded reddish brown. Habitat, most common on open bottoms, occasionally on reefs. Distribution, Florida, Bahamas, Caribbean, also Gulf of Mexico, north to North Carolina and Bermuda. Hogfish are a, uh, they're in the family wrasse of wrasses, and most people are familiar with the smaller wrasse species on the reef, but hogfish are actually the, one of the only wrasses in the uh, Western Atlantic that people eat and have a commercial value. Hogfish uh, 
are bottom feeders. They, uh, they feed in the sand and on the reef. And um, most people have noticed that they have rather large uh, snouts and large canines. And they use that to, uh, to feed in the sand and uh, feed on crustaceans, crabs. They're opportunistic feeders, which means that they will generally feed on whatever happens to be in the sand. Um, they don't target a specific species of prey in the sand. They generally sift through the sand and they can uh, either sense through smell or taste that there's a prey item and they, uh, they just simply uh, separate that prey item in their mouths from the, from the sand and expel the sand from their gills and through their mouth. Hogfish are a, uh, a species of fish that uh, sex change within the life of, a, of an individual. So in other words, a, an individual will start out as a female earlier in their life and transform into a male as they get larger and older. And uh, this, this um, mode of reproduction is quite common in fish. There's a, a, both a commercial fishery for hogfish that are taken by both uh, hook and line as well as spear. And uh, there's also recreational fisheries for them as well. They're a very good tasting fish, so they're, they're uh, highly sought after by both recreational and commercial fishermen. As part of my uh, studies with hogfish when I worked for Florida Marine Research Institute, one of the things we looked at was comparing the Florida Keys population with the eastern Gulf of Mexico uh, population around the Florida Middle Grounds. And what we generally found was that the population of the Keys, uh, individuals are generally smaller, they uh, don't live as long, and there's a high mortality. And some of these, um, these indications suggest that maybe the hogfish fishery in the Keys are being overfished. So one of the things that, um, that that residents and visitors of the Keys can keep in mind is that the, um, the current uh, minimum size for hogfish is, a, is approximately 12 inches. And uh, some of these studies suggest that perhaps 12 inches may be too small of a size, minimum size for hogfish. Um, the females oftentimes don't get a chance to reproduce even once at, at a 12 inch size. And uh, increasing the size uh, minimum size might actually improve the fishery, it might create larger uh, and more hogfish.